Which then brings us to this final term, which we've not referred to, but I hinted at a moment ago, which is the notion of training load. Well, training load is the combination of the intensity, the frequency, the duration. In essence, you multiply one to the other to the other. Whereas volume keeps intensity separate, and then has duration frequency as, as the volume metric, load is the combination of all three. And so when we talk about applying a load to the athlete, that is what we're thinking about. We're thinking about that combination of the intensity, the frequency, duration. And what we understand is that the determinants of load, not surprisingly, include all of the factors we've kind of been building to throughout the course of this session. So it relates to things like what kind of training that you're doing is it when are you doing it? is it general versus specific terms of training that we are doing when we are in the annual plan um it's it may be in relation to the, the time of the year it may be um is it you're building skill versus kind of more macro based biological adaptation so the load becomes a really important characteristic for us in terms of trying to understand the overall stress that we're applying to our athlete. Now within that, one of the things to understand is load comes in two forms. There is what we call internal and external load. And this really connects with what I mentioned earlier on within this session, which is the notion of intensity not being a quantifiable unit. Let's think about that. External load is the work completed by the athlete and that is measured independently of his or her internal characteristics. So we'll show you some data on that. So for example, speed is an external load. The, um, the load lifted in the gym, I train at 90% one rep max, that's an external load. Internal load simply reflects the relative physiological and also psychological stress imposed through the external load and that is the bit that's critical in determining the training load and subsequent adaptation. So we have to recognize this, that we impose external loads and assume that they drive an internal load. And you can see this here. What we've got here is this is a GPS tracker in the back of the rugby shirt and that is what is used by SNC coaches to track training loads or performance loads in a match. They're, they're recording things like distances covered, the speeds, the number of changes of direction, all those things, and they're using those to define a load. But what we have to recognize is that is simply external, not internal. So here we can start to see a kind of classifications of, um, of loads. So for example, we've got our basic variables of frequency and time and so on, and intensity, which can be absolute and relative. But what you start to see is when you go down a lot of these, a lot of these factors that you've got in here are quite hard to quantify. So perception of effort, yes, we use it. It's actually very difficult to quantify to get somebody to tell you, well, actually, what is that perception of effort score you're telling me? Is that whole body perception? Is that the perception of how your arms or your legs feel? We have to, be, have to understand that it's quite complicated. So things like powers and jump heights, they're very much external metrics. Whereas an internal metric might be something like a biochemical response. It might be some kind of um, psychological response. So we need to recognize that we, when we're dealing with load, and we're talking about training load, we're talking about the intensity, but remember you can't quantify that intensity, you can only qualify that intensity. So it gets quite complicated in terms of combining the load, sorry, the intensity into our load characteristic. And I thought this would be worth looking at, this is um, a schematic, it was published not, not that long ago, this is 2016, this is from Tim Gabbett's group, based out in Australia, and what they've got here is the training load per week in, it's an arbitrary unit, so remember that it, training load is intensity, frequency, duration. And then what they've done is they've plotted that against the likelihood of injury. It's a probability scale. So the higher up, higher up the scale you go, the greater the probability of getting injury. And what they've then done is that they've then plotted that against three kind of conditions. Pre-season, early competition and late competition. And what you see 
is that if we take the same training load block here, so a training load of 2,000 to 400 units, 2,000 to 4,000 units, what you can see is in late competition, it is far less well tolerated. The probability of getting an injury in the late competition period is far greater than it is for either pre-season or in the early competition phase. So this is really important to understand that load has an enormous ramification on, on, on the stress that we're imposing to the athletes. So you think in a competition, pre-season, the amount of stress, and when I I'm talking about stress here, it, that is both emotional and physical stress. So as we go into competition, we become more emotionally stressed, but we also get more physically stressed, we start to become tired. As we start to become tired, if we impose the same training on the individual, you've not only got the training that's being applied, or being applied, but you've also got the effects of the competition. The net result is that the imposed, although the imposed load hasn't changed, that's the training load, the internal load almost certainly has changed because they are more internally fatigued. So the net result is the probability of getting injury becomes greater as you go further into the competition. So it really shows for us the, 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 the importance and the relevance of understanding training load. And, and this really is, is again, this is from, from, from Tim Gabbard. And what they've then done is they've said, right, OK, let's look at the relative risk. So these are relative risk scores. And... What we're going to look at is the, the, the kind of this variable here, which is time lost. So this is time lost, um, or the relative risk of time being lost uh, in relation to different activities. So this is kind of thinking about the, the, the kind of the impact of the training. And it's quite interesting, isn't it? Look, if you, if you look down here, that very low intensity training has a relatively low risk. But as we start to, to move up, you'll notice repeated high intensity efforts. Um, look at the relative risk score. Time lost, really potentially quite high. And then the number of missed matches, you'll notice progressively increases as we go into more high intensity exercise. Look at this, high intensity exercise. But it's high intensity exercise in terms of kind of the, 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 the distances they've got them exercising at or the duration they've got them exercising at. Look at this. Really high relative risk. Relatively high risk in here in terms of when they're doing acceleration. So, so very sudden bursts of activity. Um, so quite a high load because remember you won't just do one, you'll do multiple repetitions of these. So again it shows us that we have to understand the impact of the training load, that is the intensity, the frequency, and duration of training, on not only the positive adaptations, but the negative responses. That is the, the likelihood of getting injured, missing games, or, or just, just overall losing overall time to, to, to injury. And we can kind of see this here. This is some data from Asker Jukendrup's group, relatively old data set now from 2002. But it is really useful to kind of understand a little bit. Don't worry necessarily about this, this, this data set here where they've got zones of training. This kind of just explains what they've done. But what I want to focus on here is this performance outcome. And what they've done is they've done a normal block of training here. And a bit like we saw with the Dave Costell study, they've taken an intensified period of, of training. And what they've done in the intensified period of training is that they've increased the amount of work they've done in almost all of the training zones, you can see here that the, the training that they've asked them to do, particularly in, in zone three and zone four, that's quite intense training has increased. So they're doing more training. So in other words, what we've done is we've increased the overall training load. Even if they haven't changed the intensity, they've increased the amount of training, the volume's gone up, so the overall training load has increased. Look at the effect on performance really marked reductions in terms of performance-based responses during that intensified training period. Remember, as we said earlier on, um, high volume, a, 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 a large volume of high-intensity training is actually very poorly tolerated. 
And you can see that here, but notice that when they take the intensified training period away, and actually quite significantly take it away, they actually reduce it markedly, they go into kind of recovery block, the performance bounces back, but it doesn't bounce back to where we started. Certainly for this group here. You can also see then the effect on things over here, which is like perception and mood states. They are more moody. There's a greater psychological impact that we're seeing in this intensified training period. Notice the max heart rate comes down. That's interesting, right? So the, the intensified training, they can't get to the max heart rate for whatever reason. And then their max power output comes down. Why? Because fundamentally, they're more fatigued exactly as Costal was, was, was alluding to. So although fatigue is, is going to have a potential benefit, it's also got this detrimental effect that you can see being reported here. And we see that with our load data from our marathon group. So in our load data, again, remember intensity, frequency, duration. Here's our performance characteristics in terms of marathon time. Look at the difference now in the loads. This group here, significantly greater training load compared to any of the other groups. Again, this is our outlying group, but if you look from the slowest group up, there is a progressive increase in training load, then an enormous increase when you get to this group here, which kind of ties in with what you can see with the volume-based data, but also what we saw, remember that we said that this group here, as a percentage of their race speed, actually aren't training anywhere near as high as this group. So this group here are compensating for the low volume by increasing the intensity. This group, because it's one with things we, we recognize is that there's a point where you start to, you can't keep pushing the intensity. You can't because otherwise it changes the biological adaptation. All they're going to do is just increase the volume of training, which drives up the overall training load.